I, no, I'm basic training in Louisiana, training in Fort Knox, and then I was uh, sent to uh, Italy, to Caserta, the headquarters of the Mediterranean Theater, and then I was ended up on Stars and Stripes in Funkstadt, Germany. Would you spell that for me? P F U N G S T A D T. And they have a in that little town, a little village of Funkstadt, they have a motto: Funkst Steig State is Funk stands, stays punk, but they don't know what punk means themselves. And the reason that Stars and Stripes was in this little village is because when the American army approached Frankfurt, a German mechanic who knew all the intricacies of uh, the liner type machines went through all the newspapers and magazines and uh, book publishers and took out a, a particular rod that could not be replaced easily, which disabled all the linotype machines. So we would not have been able to start publishing. Hmm. But there was a little brewery town on the other side of Darmstadt that had a little printing plant. And this guy forgot about it. And some German told the stars of tripe about it. And so we moved there and we were able to print the next day. And we stayed there for several years before moving to a bigger plant on the other side of Wiesbaden, where I think they are now. Okay, great. Well, let's backtrack a little and yep. get into jogging your memory. We're going to talk a little bit about how you got into service and why you picked that branch of service. So tell me, why did you, what made you interested in joining the service? Well, I'm going to tell you that my first introduction to the military goes back to the Civil War. I was not in the Civil War. I was not a drummer boy or a messenger, but I have a picture of me standing outside my father's drugstore in Hartford, waving a little American flag, and the Memorial Day Parade came up past my father's drugstore, and I had this strong memory of two big auto touring cars and in them were six men in blue uniforms the absolute last men of Connecticut from the Civil War so I am now 85 and if I live another 10 or 15 years I may be the last of the world to veterans. But that, that, but that isn't why I, I, I joined. I joined because, you know, when, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, everybody joined. Hmm. I was a, a freshman at the University of Michigan, and there was a, a girls' college nearby in Ypsilanti, and it was famous for its girls. It's beautiful girls. The Ipsy girls are beautiful girls, sing away, you know, that sort of stuff. So me and my roommate were hitchhiking on the Sunday to Ypsilanti to check out the girls. We were picked up by a, a beat-up old car, by a beat-up old man, and called a radio with static, and suddenly there was an interruption around 3 o'clock that Pearl Harbor had been bombed. Hmm. So we stopped the car, we jumped out, we hitchhiked back to to Ann Arbor and into the dormitory and that night at the dormitory tables all we talked about was Pearl Harbor. Most of us said where the hell is Pearl Harbor? We didn't really, we were not aware of Pearl Harbor because you know it was so far away and uh, we had bases God knows where and our army wasn't all that big. So an uh, 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 enterprising uh, boy from the Ann Arbor News was peddling the papers with uh, charging us twice the price and we snapped them up and it told us where Pearl Harbor was and then immediately we learned that the army was short of junior officers and wanted college boys to sign up for the 90-day uh, program 
where they would become officers. They were called 90 Day Wonders. And uh, it was a pejorative term and it also was a term of, of uh, appreciation because recently a museum has been started that has the names of 2,000 uh, men and women who were 90, say, well, 90, 90 uh, day wonders who uh, got all sorts of medals and honors. So the, uh, those young officers were, uh, were quite valuable and useful as we were getting the army ready for fighting. My eyes were 2,400. 2,400, you could not be an officer. But I went down anyhow, and I knew that if I could see the big E, that I could qualify. So I figured I would fake it. And I, the, the uh, ROTC was in an old Victorian house, and the, uh, the officer was a doctor, said, put your hands over your eyes. I said, Yo, what do you see? I can, said, I, well, I can see the big E. Anything else? No. He says, keep walking towards the chart until you can see the second line. So I walked through the first room, through the second room. When I got to the third room, I said, Ooh, it's a B, not an E. And he says, out. <laughs> so I was deferred because of my eyes and the fact that I was taking engineering throughout the, uh, the war. Hmm. So I was on campus. And uh, people have asked, was the campus of the University of Michigan awash in girls with no men during the war? And the answer is no. The uh, military and, the, and the, the government and private contractors went into all the big universities that they could. And they, we had thousands of, we trained thousands of sailors, private contractors, army men, and we had a, a Japanese professor. He proposed uh, training soldiers in Japanese. So we had a Japanese program, and everybody else walked up and down the diagonal and the other uh, walkways of the campus. But when the uh, Japanese language uh, group changed classes, they were in formation, and they ran, and the rest of us had to jump off the sidewalk to get out of their way. So in addition to that, the university, many of the university professors <clears throat> were siphoned off to go to the uh, Manhattan Project. Mm. I myself uh, got out of the dormitory and uh, moved into a, a cooperative house. The cooperatives are very big in the Midwest. They're hardly known here in the East. You, uh, it's like a dorm, it's like a fraternity, mm. except you have a mix of, of uh, boys and girls, different uh, economic, different races. I, for example, uh, had a black roommate. Now, when I, uh, 40, 50 years later, when I was on the Hartford Times, I mentioned that a black girl said, well, that's no big deal, I had a white roommate. I said, you do now, but back in 1941, it was a different story. <coughs> so the, uh, the, um, oh, oh, so in order to also make a little extra money, even though the, the, uh, the uh, cooperative was quite inexpensive. It cost us five dollars and fifty cents a week for food and, and lodgings. But we did all the work, unlike mm -hmm. the the, uh, mm -hmm. the washing and the cooking. I learned how to cook, and we, we ate apple butter in big containers. Now you buy a little little container of apple butter. It's a it's a luxury. It could cost you five dollars. <laughs> Do you recall um, when you went to boot camp? Yes. Well, tell me about uh, that. Okay. Well, uh, the war ended, and I got a job, uh, 1945, on a Detroit Free Press. I okay. worked there for six months, and then they, uh, the the veterans started to come back, and under the law, they had to give them their jobs back. Mm -hmm. So I got a job with the United Press in, in Detroit. And I covered the first of the big strikes of the United Auto Workers against the big automobile companies because they now wanted a piece of the pie. 
You know, the auto companies made a lot of money during the war, mm -hmm. making mm -hmm. tanks and guns and all that sort of stuff. So that was very exciting. I mean, I, I, I sat on Walter Woos's lap for uh, four or five months. It was very interesting. But then, uh, after six months of that, they got some veterans that came back, and they said to me, well, we either let you go, but we have an opening in Springfield, Illinois. So I said, I'll take it. I was unmarried and had no responsibility. So I went to Springfield, Illinois. My uh, bureau chief had just come back from the Navy. He was the man, he was the man who stood on the deck with these things like this, telling the planes to move up and down. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine the tension that must have gone through that guy. The, the, the life of that plane, and also maybe the the the, 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 the integrity of the, of the ship, depending on whether or not he got that plane down safely mm -hmm. and it didn't crash or run off or run, catch on fire. He was a very calm, easy-going guy. After uh, several months with the United Press in uh, Springfield, Illinois, I suddenly get a letter from the Hartford Draft Board. Okay. And today, kids call up their mothers every day because they got cell phones. I made, because I was a, 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 a depression child, uh, this was my second long distance call. I called up the draft board and I got a woman on the, board, on the phone and I said, do you folks know that the war has ended? And she didn't take that very well. She thought that was a churlish remark and she said, yes. We know the war has ended, and the men, the warriors who fought it are coming home, and you're going over <clears throat> into the occupation, so get on the next train and come to Hartford. So I went to Hartford. They sent me to uh, uh, Fort uh, Camp Polk in Louisiana. It's now a fort. It was such a terrible place, I thought they would eliminate it because it was all sand and everything. But you know what they're using it for? They're on this on this sand and heat uh, ground. They're building mock villages yeah. of the of Iraq and Afghanistan. So they're training these guys how to do house to house uh, training. So it's yeah. become a big major fort. Mm -hmm. Well, they kept me out of the army for because of my eyes, right? Right. With my glasses on, <clears throat> when we finally got towards the end of basic training, we got to. Uh, the, the uh, rifle range. I got six. I got eight eight bull's eyes in a row. <laughs> so I, I could have been a I could have been a sniper. It was, actually, keeping me out was a, was a stupid reason, because they said if you dropped your glasses, uh, in, in, you know, you're confronting a, another uh, infantryman, you would uh, be helpless. Mm. But the fact of the matter is, for every man or woman in combat actually on the firing line. There are nine people in support. I ended up on Stars and Stripes. Okay. I could have been on Stars and Stripes in 1942, along with Andy Rooney. You know how he got on Stars and Stripes? He had never done any journalism. He was a company clerk. Hmm. He saw an ad for, for uh, Stars and Stripes was looking for reporters. He applied and he got, he got, got accepted. He went on, on, uh, on bombing runs. Hmm. from England, which were dangerous at that time. No, they were always dangerous. Can I tell you a, a story not about me, but about my cousin? Okay. He was a, a navigator on a flying fortress. The plane coming back from a bombing run got damaged as it was leaving Germany, and they bailed out over France. They all, eight men, landed safely, the French underground picked them up and moved them at night north to Calais and in the uh, daytime they hit them in barns. Mm -hmm. When they got to Calais, they uh, radioed the British and the British said, we'll send a, a, a submarine over tomorrow night to pick them up. So the French fed the boys that night and sent them to a new Lala house. You know what that is. Mm. Would you like to tell the camera? I will when I get to the, okay. to the climax of my story. <laughs> so, next night, the, the submarine picks them up, they get back, and they're ushered into their 
commanding officer's uh, office, and they all saluted. And my my cousin said, "We all saluted, and we thought that our commander was going to be so happy to get back a crew. We were we lost weight, but we were healthy. We were all none of us had <coughs> we were sick." And our commanding officer said. What's this I hear about you guys going to a French whorehouse last <laughs> night? The commanding officer was Jimmy Stewart. Ah, very good. <laughs> That's a neat story. That's a great story. Now, you mentioned you were at Fort Polk. Then yes. where did you go? I went to uh, Fort Knox. Okay. I, I Can just, you tell me something about what happened, what it was like at Fort Knox for you at that point? Yeah, Fort Knox was oh, so much different than Camp Polk. Fort Knox was an established fort with brick dormitories mm -hmm. surrounding a big you know, big field and the the, uh, the barracks in, in brick buildings were on one side and across on the other side uh, were the homes of the uh, of the officers okay and I was uh, because I uh, had done well with the uh, when they give you a test when you were when you, when you get in to see how fast you can learn the Morse code mm-hmm three or four letters. Well, my brother was a, a radio ham, so I knew the Morse code. So I did it. Unfortunately, I made a mistake and did it all perfectly. So they sent me to Fort Knox to be trained in tanks <coughs> as a radio operator. Okay. So we spent most of our time in classrooms learning the Morse code. I got up to 25 words a minute. Wow. Then when they finally put us in the tanks, they put the key the Morse code key around our leg on one of those bicycle uh, things that you used to wear in the old days mm -hmm. and around your thing. Now you don't. I don't use them anymore. Mm -hmm. Now it's all planned spandex or whatever they call it. Well, when you're in a moving tank and you're trying to hit a key, from 25 words a minute, I was down to eight words a minute. Wow. And then, <laughs> do you remember any of your instructors? Yes, but uh, but what I got to say about them is not complimentary. <laughs> okay, so is that all right? Yeah. yeah I had a, a southern corporal who talked very slow, and he spent a whole hour teaching us how to use an on and off button on a radio. Mm. And he kept, and it was so boring and so stupid. I mean, how long does it take to learn how to use an on and off button? Ten, ten seconds? So I started taking notes. And he saw me and he said, What you all doing there? It was a southern. What you all doing there, Yankee boy? So I said, Well, I'm taking notes. Well, he was kind of mad at me, but he, there was nothing that he, he, he could do about it. But I did have a, a funny experience in, in Fort Knox. They always had a, a, have an officer of the night in the in the um, mm -hmm. you know in the, in the commanding officers. Uh, somebody had to be on night duty, and it was the NCOs and the the, the cadre there who felt they were spending too much time. And they said, "Well, why don't we take some of the uh, smarter uh, st students and have them fill in for us?" So I said, "Lashmer." <coughs> You're going on um, night duty. He said, all you have to do is stay up until 9 o'clock, then go to bed. Because nothing, nothing happens. So there I am in the office. At 9 o'clock I go to bed. Well, because it was a dormitory with with, with bricks, well, I couldn't hear what was going on in the, uh, in, in the barracks. Mm. But there was a Texan there, and somehow he got drunk, and they made a big fuss and a big noise. And the noise went across the field, and the the um, officers' wives complained, and so they I, I'm, I'm laying there sleeping, and there's a knock on the door and a tumult, and I open the door, and there's a there's a colonel, and an MP, and another officer, and I says, "What's the problem?" And they said, "Come out here." I said, uh, "Yes, sir, I, I will, but I uh, I was in my green underwear." I said, as soon as I, I get dressed, sir. He said, no, don't get dressed. Come out here now. <laughs> I felt so silly. 
coming out and saluting in my green underwear. <laughs> <laughs> so the next day, they sent us to a, to the general, me and the Texan, and the general was very very sympathetic with the uh, with the Texan. He said, "I understand you. You got a lot of energy and." Uh, and all that sort of stuff. And he was very sympathetic with him and he says, but you, you fell asleep on, on the on duty. And he was mad at me, but he put both of us on, on KP for the for the weekend. And we got to be good friends. Do you still stay in touch with him? No. <laughs> After Fort Knox and uh, Fort yeah. Polk and Fort Knox, yeah. then where did you go and what was your job well, assignment? <laughs> They were, since we, they were going to take us all. Oh, I, I want to tell you another funny story about Fort Knox. I had studied German for three years in, in high school mm -hmm. because uh, if you're going to go into science and engineering, you always studied German. That's before the, uh, the, the Nazi thing, but they kept the, the tradition of studying, you know. Mm -hmm. It takes years before you get rid of, a, of a, something you don't need. They had a. They posted a notice that the, they had a night school at Fort Knox. Naturally, they called it the School of Hard Knocks. And they were going to have a refresher course in German. So I said, "Well, that's a good idea." So after dinner, I got rid of my fatigues, took a shower, got dressed, went went to the school. And when I got to the desk of the German uh, class, uh, the g captain behind the desk said. Uh, uh, soldier, uh, yes sir, do you speak German? I said, I came to take the uh, refresher course, uh, Captain. He said, you didn't answer the question, do you speak German? I said, well sir, I studied it for three years in high school, but I can't say that I'm a, a, you know, a linguist in, in German. Mm -hmm. He says, come closer. So I leaned over, he says, we're short of instructors. So I ended up teaching the course. <laughs> And you know how I did it? The Army had this, you know, the, the lesson plan. Yep. I stayed one lesson ahead of the class. <laughs> oh, so then now comes time, what next? Job assignment. Where yes. did you go? Everybody was going to be given an island in the Pacific in a radio. Okay. I wanted to go to Stars and Stripes. And I went into uh, Louisiana, into Louisville, and by accident, I met the, uh, the uh, Sunday editor who had just come back from Stars and Stripes. He gave me the name of the colonel who was in charge of the European edition of the Stars and Stripes. I wrote to him. He yeah. sent me back uh, uh, orders uh, assigning me to Stars and Stripes. Twelve pages of the same thing. Mm -hmm. But you really can't do that. You can't ask for a man. You can only ask for an MOS. So, I, when they got ready to give everybody an island, I showed this to uh, uh, you know, the, the, the first guy I they interviewed me. Just, I, I never saw anything like this. So they passed me up to the colonel. I think I can tell the story about this colonel now because he's probably dead. So he said to me, I've never seen easy to do. They, they look a little strange to me, but you might get away with it. He says, I'm going to give you some advice, but you if you tell anybody that, that I gave you this advice, I'm going to deny it. Hmm. He says, go to the Pentagon and go see General such and such and show him these things. And one of two things will happen. You will get assigned to Stars and Stripes or you will get court-martialed for going over our heads. I don't know where I got the ball, excuse my language, but I don't know where I got the balls to do it. But I did it. I took a three-day pass and went down to Washington I went to the Pentagon, I walked through all those halls. I was scared as hell. I really was. I got to the general's office, I opened the door, I slewed the teachers. What is it, son? And I came up, I showed him these orders, got on the phone, and he got off. He said, okay, are you satisfied? I said, well, I'm sorry, sir, I didn't hear what you said. He said, go and see Captain such and such, we're assigning you to Stars and Stripes. So, you know, you have to use initiative. Sometimes, sometimes you have to stretch the rules a little. That's so right. That's how I got a, a got the to signs of stars and stripes. What was a typical day for you like? On stars and stripes. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, 
and this is probably the first time I've admitted this in public, but I wanted to be on Stars and Stripes so badly. Actually, the experience on the Stripes itself were a disappointment. The experience of being in Europe right after the war, traveling around, seeing the destruction, seeing the people, dealing with the people, and having an, an opportunity. We, we worked 11 days on and had three days off, hmm. which is very rare. So with three days, you, get, you go the night before. I could travel, because we took over the trains, the army took over. I could go to all over to, to, to Germany, all over to Italy, to Switzerland, to, yeah. to France. So uh, I had a marvelous time, in, in effect, you might say. I was on, I was on a vacation. I was on a tour. Mm. Now I didn't. My Stars and Stripes was a disappointment because I thought I was going to be a reporter. Mm -hmm. I had been a reporter for, in in Detroit mm -hmm. on big city newspaper, been a reporter for the United Press. I was a writer. They didn't send people out on stories because the war had ended, and the stories from the the, the various companies that were occupying Germany. Somebody, some member of the company would send in some little notices and we would publish them. They came in on the, on the teletype machine or by mail. So my job was principally being a copy editor. Okay. I hate copy editing. I am a lousy copy editor. When I write a story, I need a copy editor to clean it up. I'm a really a good writer. <coughs> and. Uh, so that part of it was not very rewarding, but uh, the, the rest of it was. We, uh, what's his name, Bill Malden, who already left, and uh, we had a, uh, well, you know, we, in those days we called Negroes Negroes or colored people, and that's what they called themselves. We didn't call them blacks, but we had a Negro, uh, he's now an African American, I had a cartoonist, okay. and one day he and I, he and I, and another guy got a three-day pass, and we went to Paris. And he had been the cartoonist had been also writing, doing cartoons for a French newspaper. So we had a lot of fun in Paris, and we ran out of money, and we took our our black cartoonist. And Locked them in a hotel room and we said, write cartoons for your French newspaper, we need money. <laughs> so he did. He sold them. We had enough money to finish uh, our tour and, uh, and come back. Do you remember his name? No, I don't. Yeah. No. Um, when you were there, what other memorable experiences did you have about being in Europe after the occupation? Well. The, uh, <coughs> let me just give you an illustration with the little village that I lived in. Mm -hmm. The girls could be had by the soldiers for package of cigarettes. Uh, many of them were quite fat because of their diet that they'd had. Now you see these slim, lovely German models. Of my my, I didn't see anything. I didn't see anything like that when I was there. But. Uh, in in uh, Funkstadt, every morning you saw the the honey wagon go by. Mm -hmm. You know what the honey mm -hmm. wagon is, and also because the horses would drop the manure, the women would rush out and sweep it up to use in their backyard gardens. Mm -hmm. We didn't have a barracks in this little village, so we took the the elementary school and kicked all the kids out of it, and. Took, took all the desks, God knows what we did with them, and put our, our beds, our cots in the school, and built showers and all that sort of stuff. And I forget, we had a, we had a mess hall that wasn't in the, in the school. One of my most memorable uh, memories, and memorable memories, wonderful, uh, was at the edge of town there was a farmer who was plowing his, his field for the uh, spring planting. Mm -hmm. He didn't have a tractor, he didn't have a horse, he didn't have a, um, a mule. 
who was pulling the tractor? Or who was pulling the, the plow? His old wife. Mm. Imagine that. And then, well, as well, she, I guess she survived, and eventually they all, uh, you know, got uh, things changed. I finally one day decided <coughs> I wanted <coughs> to take a three day pass and go to Berlin. Now, we had been driving around in Jeeps. It was you know, the vehicle of choice of the American Army. Mm -hmm. It was one of the worst winters in 50 years. And uh, the guys in the motor pool did their best to close the Jeeps in, but there was no heater in the Jeep. And we had long winter underwear and great coats and everything. Volkswagen came out with its first cars. We bought six of them. It didn't have very much power. It, uh, top speed on the downhill would be about 50 miles an hour. You had to keep shifting all the time. But when they, uh, the, the Volkswagens arrived, and when the captain learned I was going to, to Berlin by train, he said, look, take the Volkswagen, drive it to Berlin, because we were going to have our bureau chief in Berlin have one of the Volkswagens. Mm. And without, every time it takes to travel, just add that on, and you can, uh, you know, have your three days in Berlin. I said, where am I going to eat and sleep? He said, pull into any army uh, base you see, and they'll put you out, and they'll feed you. So I got into the Volkswagen, and they, we had to cross through the, they gave me a whole lot of papers to get through each of the different zones, the mm -hmm. French and the English and the German, and the, not the German, but the, uh, the, the Russian zone. And uh, I, so the first night I spent in Kassel, and uh, then the next morning I'm driving along, and at no time I come upon another a, a British base. And I pull in, and uh, I ask them if uh, I could uh, would they uh, feed me lunch. Mm -hmm. So they call some officers. They're all dressed in spiffy. British uniforms, but they talk with a funny accent. I said, excuse me, sir, but you all look very British, but your accent is not really quite British. He says, we are Norwegians, hmm. all of us. When uh, Norway was invaded, we fled to England and joined uh, the British Army. Hmm. So I, uh, I thought that was, that was Kind of strange. I finally get to the final uh, crossing, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the British, and there's a, a, a sergeant there, and there's a, a good-looking girl, all dressed in black clothes, and the sergeant says to me, uh, "Will you take the girl to Berlin?" She has to. She wants to go to Berlin. I said, "I can't take her to Berlin. She has no papers. How am I going to get her the papers?" I said, "The Russians will send me in a gulag if I try and smuggle her in." He says. Go into the uh, into the office and get yourself a cup of tea and some uh, scones and bring some out for the for, for us. And so I did that. When I come out, he's putting the girl's baggage in the back seat of my car, and she's sitting in the front seat. I said, "What are you doing? I can't do this. I can't get the girl through the Russian door." And he says, "Ah, you Yanks got a, got away with things. You, you'll you'll figure it out. You'll figure it out, mate." So. I get to the Russian border, and window down, a Russian sticks his head in the window. He looked like a peasant who couldn't read. When I showed him the, the papers, he gave them back to me without even looking at him, and he says, Haben Sie etwas Zigaretten? So I gave him a package of cigarettes, <coughs> and we continued. It's March. It's still cold. Snow is still on the, on the grass. About Twenty minutes or so down the road, my eye, you know how, how a cat sleeps with one eye open? Mm -hmm. One eye saw light on the floor of the car. He said, there's no light in this car. I look in the back, the car's on fire. So I jammed the brakes on and I told the girl, get the hell out! She gets out and starts running down the road. I take off my greatcoat 
and I started beating out the fire. And I got it beaten out. Hmm. And I said, you're a stupid little car. And I didn't know what to do. No cell phone, no uh, AAA, no nothing. Because we, we were on a, on a, a Helmstedt Road, hmm. which um, is a, a part, of the, part of the Autobahn. Oh, incidentally, before I left, they gave me a, a Colt pistol because some people never made it on that uh, 100 miles through the Russian zone. But I had only learned how to use a, an M1 rifle. I didn't know how to use a, a pistol. I didn't know how to load it. So I put the fire out. I didn't know what to do. And I got back in the car and I said, oh, what the hell? And I turned the key. <laughs> so I drove down, stopped the car at the girl. I said, uh, going to Berlin? So she got back in. I said, why did you run away? Why didn't you help me? She says, I had been through four years of explosions and bombs, and uh, you have five gas cans in the back there. They could have blown up and, and you would have been incinerated. I was too stupid to realize the danger I took staying next to that car. Yeah. But I was lucky. So she got in, and uh, I was speaking German to her. By this time, I got to be pretty fluent because I was talking to all the kids in the, in Funkstadt. The, the, I, I learned later on that the Funkstadt people liked me more than most of the other soldiers because whenever I was walking back from the barracks to the to the office, I was always giving the little kids uh, chocolate and mm. chewing gum and that sort of stuff. The little kids hadn't done anything to my people yet. <laughs> so, you know. Well, when you were, we're over we're, there. We're driving along though, and I, remember I suddenly see a, an American flag. Mm -hmm. And I, I, so enough, it was a, an, out, an American outpost halfway there, and they uh, and, and he, they were just checking on to make sure that we were getting through, and gave me a cup of co some coffee for both of us and some, some donuts and all that. Then we continued, and another 20 minutes, going up a slight hill, there was a big explosion in front of me. And again, I jammed on the brakes, and four Russian soldiers ran towards my car with fixed bayonets. And I put out my gun and I said to the girl, I'm not a combat infantryman. Who, who are these guys running at me with bayonets? She says, I think you ought to put that little thing away. So I put the gun away, open the window. An officer sticks his head in and he says, he told me because it had been such a terrible winter, the Elbow River had frozen. Now the ice floes were breaking up and they were threatening the piles of the bridge. So he says, uh, how much he had five cigarettes? And so him, I gave a cart. <laughs> he stopped with the, uh, the, the explosions. We went over the bridge. We got to Berlin about 10 o'clock, and the, the city being, you know, massive ruins, <laughs> there were hardly any lights, but the first light we came upon was a service club. Hmm. So I said, well, I'll stop in the service club and get directions because I was going to stay overnight in a house, a big house, that the army had taken over as a, a, a press club, mm -hmm. you know, for, for visiting uh, uh, newspaper men. <coughs> so I go into the club, and it was a club for black soldiers. The uh, officer in charge was white, and all the black soldiers were sitting at tables, and somebody was playing a, a band and they had uh, white German girlfriends. And the captains explained to me, he said, the, the black soldiers have explained to the, to the white German girls that the reason that they're, they're, they have this dark skin is because they're, they're night fighters. <laughs> oh yes, isn't that a nice story? Mm -hmm. <coughs> so we finally get to the house, and uh, I got a room, and the, 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 the girl talked herself into it talked the old lady into giving her a room too because they had some empty room. She was going to uh, visit her or, or to, to join her boyfriend who was a fighter pilot in Munich who had been transferred to Tempelhof. Okay. So the next day I drove her to Tempelhof, 
went to the bureau and the bureau chief was nice enough to let me keep the Volkswagen the three days I was there and his uh, German office manager drove me around so I got to see everything. And one day we went to lunch at the press club okay. and we sat with uh, Theodore White, who was one of the guys at the club. We're going to fast forward 20 years later here in, in Connecticut I was at a party at Skitch Henderson's mm -hmm. and I see Theodore White and he's talking to another man. And I went over and I stood next to them hoping he would, hoping I could say something to him. Finally he looks at me and he says, We're, if you want to talk about Harvard, join the conversation. I said, well, no, if I want to talk about a university, I'll talk about my own, Michigan. I said, but I wanted to say something to you, Mr. White. He says, I had lunch with you in the press club on March 27th in Berlin and you told us about the story how you drove to Berlin in the in the first Volkswagen. What about that for, for a memory? Yeah. That was 1945? Or no, no, that was, all, that was already 19, that was already 1950. Ah, okay. Or 50, after, after I'd come back. But you were oh, in the press oh, club, what? Yeah, I was in the press club in uh, when I was with Stars and Stripes in 19, uh, yeah, that would have been 1945, right. That's yeah, so he remember over 10 years he remembered. Well, he was an outstanding journalist, and, and for good reason. Yeah. So, the, the, the night before I'm to leave, they had a party for me. I crawled into bed exhausted, and at 3 o'clock there's a knock on the door. I'm in my green underwear. I get up, I open the door. And there's the girl that I had that I brought. And so I got into bed and I said, come on in. I said, what are you doing here? She said, well, I'm going uh, back to Munich. I said, what happened to your boyfriend? Oh, he got another girlfriend. I hate him. I, kind of said, I said, where have you been? And she said, I've been downstairs for a few the whole time. Hmm. So I said, good luck. She hugged me and that was the end of Hilda. Uh. When you were over in, in uh, Germany, how did you correspond with your families? I wrote a letter once a week to my uh, mother, and she wrote me back. My father was too busy. He had a drugstore, and he, he was sending uh, four boys to college. And incidentally, all, all four of us were in the service, and my mother said I didn't raise my children to be soldiers, but I was happy that I was able to feed them well enough so they passed the physical. Most people don't realize that over a million and a half American boys were rejected by the service because they were undernourished mm. from during the Depression. Hmm. Hmm. Do you remember um, any food? Does any food stand out in your mind? Well. Either the well, militaries, that well, the, was... The, 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 the military food was all, um, you know, the, the military food was all American food. <clears throat> you know, the typical meat, potatoes, nothing nothing of German style. Okay. I do remember once in uh, Munich, I, I stopped into a, in, into a beer stube to have some lunch, and an old waiter came up to me and he looked at me and he says, Hell! <laughs> and I said, hell, yeah. And I suddenly remembered, hell meant light, light beer. <laughs> I thought he was swearing at me. <laughs> but they, they had a famous beer, Lowenbrau, mm -hmm. and it was very watery. It didn't have, they didn't have the hops, they didn't, you know, they didn't have the, the wherewithal to make the, the, the famous beers. And there were, uh, I don't recall that we ever went into any German uh, restaurants. Okay. You know, the, the food just wasn't good enough. How about supplies? Did you have any supplies that you had problems getting? No. We had uh, all the clothes that we needed, the warm underwear and, uh, and boots, you know, leg uh, because it was so cold. Mm. Uh, the the great coats, we had raincoats. One of the things they gave us, and uh, I wish I still had it, is there was something called 
a constabulary, which really acted as a national American police force. Mm. And the constabulary had a woolen insert, but really heavy woolen, with a, you know, a, a covering with a hood. Okay. And um, it, as many as, as as we could, I got a hold of one, and it really kept you warm during the winter. Hmm. Um, when you were there now, it was occupation time. Yes. Did you feel any pressure or stresses while you were there? Only at the beginning. Okay, can you tell me a little bit about that? At the very that? beginning, they, when I was, you know, on my way to Germany, they talked about uh, the Germans were going to have wolf packs, and they were going to uh, uh, be um, like like the insurgents, uh, you know, like the, uh, mm -hmm. that we have in, in Iraq today. These people were going to continue to uh, harass and bomb and shoot and kill Americans. And, uh, oh, I do have to tell you about another incident, another thing that happened to me. In, is, I had a roommate in uh, in Ann Arbor. He was uh, a German, not a German, an Austrian Jew, whose family had got out uh, ahead of Hitler, and he uh, was my roommate for about four or five months, and then he got drafted immediately, and sent almost immediately to Germany mm -hmm. to act as an interpreter and a uh, interrogator. Mm -hmm. He liked me very much. He, he sort of hung around me like a dog, like a little puppy. And about two weeks after I arrived at Schwungstadt, I got a letter from Hartford forwarded to me by my mother from him. Huh. He, uh, when he got discharged from the army, he got hired again as a contract private uh, uh, interpreter. Hmm. As a matter of fact, we all, all of the army units hired lots of, of German civilians. Mm -hmm. In our motor pool, we had German mechanics, they were Luftwaffe, not SS, but the Luftwaffe mm -hmm. or Gestapo, we didn't have those people, but regular, ordinary German uh, soldiers. And every now and then I would go down and talk with them. I remember uh, asking one of, the, one of the Germans who had fought but on all the fronts, I said, who is the toughest soldier that you fought up against? Do you have any idea? Mm -hmm. I thought maybe you'd say the Russians. The Scots. Hmm. Well, I've been in Scotland, and they live in, a, <coughs> in, a, in, a, in an environment that's tough. It's cold and uh, you know, it's, it doesn't have the, the, the wealth of the rest of England, mm -hmm. or even of Wales. But um, they're, uh, they make good soldiers. Huh. Yeah. I know they're, they're in many places. Um, oh, I started to tell you about the, uh, my, my roommate. I yes. Got this, I got this, uh, this letter forwarded to me by my mother, and I said to the office manager, a German woman, I said, do you know where this place is where he, you know, he had a return address? Do you happen to know where this, uh, this city is? She said, yes, it's four kilometers from here. Hmm. Four kilometers? So she got on the phone, called him up. She said to me, here's your Mr. Newfield. I said, John. He said, Barney, where are you? I said, it's four kilometers. He was in a big house that they'd taken over from somebody and he had a car and we had so much wonderful times traveling around together when we had the opportunity and one day I was in his house and I said have you ever been in the cellar he says no why I said well maybe there's something there that, that, that you might be find interesting so we went in the cellar and it was a wine cellar with the most expensive wines we managed to drink through half of it <laughs> So he uh, finally got discharged and went back to uh, Washington and he was working for the government in Washington and after I got home I got a letter from his sister who said 
John stepped off the curb in Washington and got hit by a, a streetcar and was killed. Ah. Oh. So <laughs> holy. Unbelievable. How yeah. do you how would you spell his last name? N E U N E U V F E L D. F E L D. Yeah, John. Um, so, so we would still be friends if uh, you know mm. if that hadn't happened. Mm. To go through that experience. Yeah. When you you talked about traveling around and you yep. talked about you know the adventures that you had there, mm -hmm. um, do you remember any other places that you went and traveled while you were in, in the military? Well, <laughs> the Swiss decided to uh, invite a certain number of soldiers down for, a, I think it was a 12-day tour of Switzerland, mm -hmm. all expenses paid. So I signed up for it, and we had working for us a, a very nice Swiss girl. And she said to me, when you get to Switzerland, uh, when you get to Bern, um, call up my family and go out and visit them. They're only uh, uh, 40 minutes away by train. Mm. And um, my parents, they don't speak uh, English, but you can speak your fractured German to them. And my 19-year-old uh, sister speaks English. So uh, we went on to, uh, to Switzerland, and when we first got to our first station in Switzerland, the guys got off the train and went crazy because they were the first bananas that we had seen. <laughs> That's one thing the army didn't ship to us. <laughs> bananas and chocolates and uh, all that sort of stuff. Well, I did, I did take the day off, and I went out to, uh, the village was called Herzogenbuchsee. So I'm on the Can train. Can you spell that? You want me to spell? Well, you yes. know, I, I, I punched it up on the internet, and they don't call it Herzog and Buchse anymore. They just call it Buchse. But it was Herzog and H E R Z O G E N B U C H E E. And it was a little village. So as the train, the train was approaching Herzog and Buchse, I got up to get off. Mm -hmm. And the conductor says, no tourists in here talking about say, you know, nothing to see. I says, uh, ich will meine Großmutter saying, I'm going to see my grandmother. He says, oh, your grandmother. So he stops the train, he lets me off, and out comes this beautiful 19-year-old girl, and he's watching. <laughs> and uh, when, I, when I left, two days later, he said, you have a beautiful Großmutter. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I uh, I fell in love with her, and uh, after going back three or four times, I proposed, and we got engaged. And I was going to get down for a month because I had a month left of uh, leave time. And the army said, "No, you're going to go home." I, so I, I, I went to my commanding officer, or you know, the editor in chief. I said, "I got 30 days. We we'll pay you." I said, "I don't need the damn money. I just need the time." So I went home without her, and uh, it, it's, 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 it by itself is an interesting story, but uh, I'll write a book and uh, I'll, give, I'll give you an autographed copy. <laughs> that sounds good. Um, but, excuse me, one other thing that's okay. quite interesting is that watching the Germans cleaning up the rubble. Hmm. Tell me about that. They uh, they would stand in line, uh, like um, you know I don't know what you call it, but the kind of line where you're passing things one to the other. Mm -hmm. And uh, here here we think of the Germans, you know, the, the Germans who with, with the uh, the death camps and all that sort of stuff. But among themselves, ordinary Germans are very polite, mm -hmm. and they're always saying. Bitte schön, danke schön. And a cartoonist had a big cartoon, and he had the Germans handing the rocks to each other, and underneath it says, Bitte schön, danke schön, bitte schön, danke schön, bitte schön, danke schön. 
But they said about it right away. Now the the village next to us, Darmstadt. See, there was there was Frankfurt and Darmstadt, and then Frankfurt. Mm -hmm. It was wiped out. The Americans would bomb in the daytime because they wanted to hit certain targets. Mm -hmm. But they also were, were targets themselves. The British, with Kurt Churchill, he was so mad that uh, the bombing of, of London, the bombing of Coventry, they bombed at night uh, and they just would wipe out a city. They wiped out Darmstadt. Okay. Why did they wipe out, wipe out Darmstadt? It had an engineering school. That's all it had. It was. It, it, that had anything to do with the war. And in that school, they were making, they had developed and made a, a critical part that operated the, the uh, B-2 bombs that, uh, what's his name, uh, you know, the German that we brought over that sent up mm. our first rockets. I forget his name. Von Braun? Von Braun? Von Braun, yeah, right. Yeah, so they, they, that school has since been rebuilt because a, couple, a year or so ago there was a contest for engineering schools all over the, uh, the world to uh, make a house that was the most, uh, used the less amount of fuel and was mm. cooler in the summertime without any fuel. Mm -hmm. The engineering school of Darmstadt won the first prize. Mm. I said, oh. <laughs> They fixed it too. So they, they uh, oh, so they, and there was, you know, when I told you that I was a little uh, uh, nervous at first about this, uh, these um, uh, wolf packs, none of that happened. Okay. The Germans had had enough. It, it wasn't like, uh, it wasn't like like the Iraqis that had all these different clans and tribes and all that sort of mm. stuff. The Germans had had four years of it, you know, and, and they were city after city. But there was so much of it that wasn't uh, touched. But they, you know, villages and towns that had no uh, nothing to no no manufacturing plants. Mm. I remember visiting. Uh, uh, the home of the industrials in the in the in the Ruhr. No, I forget his name. But uh, you know, those those guys, those industrials, were put in jail. But uh, they eventually were let out. And uh, there was a lot of uh, there was feeling developing on higher levels, and I'm not really privy to it. But there were feelings that. We wanted the Germans to be on our side in case we had to fight the Russians that once once the Iron Curtain was set up. So you know, when when we started with the Iraqi War, we still had fifty thousand uh, men in the uh, station in Germany. We got forty thousand in in Korea. We got that, that's why our our, our our army is you know running out of out of men and space and time and. We're, we're, we're stretched all over. Well, that kind of leads me to another question. Yes. Um, when you think about your military experience, uh, you just expressed a little bit of uh, your feelings about the military. In general, what are your feelings about the military service and war? Well, this is going to sound kind of self-serving and very selfish on my part, but I've felt that if you didn't get wounded or killed, that military service is one of the best things that can happen to a any men. And not, I guess women too. But we had we had women but we didn't have them up there the way they the way they have them uh, you know hmm. in the front lines the way they do today. What did the women do, do you remember? With a wax, they were they were mostly in offices, you know, in, in the finance offices, in uh, the, the, uh, a lot of a lot of time and energy had to be spent in personnel, tracking where people went and 
and their pay and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I have a funny story about tracking. My mother made a, a cake during the Depression that didn't have any milk, eggs, or butter in it. And we called it anti this cake, and it was delicious. It was a raisin cake. She wrapped one up and sent one to me to, uh, when, when I was in Italy, thinking I was going to be there. And <clears throat> the Army has this APO service. Mm -hmm. I had already been transferred to Germany when the cake arrived in Italy, and instead of looking up my APO number, they put it on another troop ship and it went back to, to New York. They found out my number. They put it on another troop ship, and four months later, the cake arrived in Germany, and it was just as fresh as it's the day. <laughs> and so we ate it. All I could call my buddies ate it, and we enjoyed it. <laughs> Let me tell you something about the attitude of the military towards the girl. One of the one of the major problems during the during the occupation was guys getting gonorrhea and mm -hmm. some getting syphilis. So they had big billboards on the, on the roads, big billboards with beautiful blonde faces of beautiful blonde girls. Mm -hmm. And the headline says, she looks clean, but. Now if you were a German a girl in German, this, this, this shirt had to be an insult of mm. in monumental proportions. But, it was a major problem, uh, the guys getting uh, getting uh, some sort of a venereal disease. All right, let me ask you one more question, then I'll wind this one up. Um, well, I let me ask another question. Did you ever join any veterans organizations when you yes. came back? Yeah. Which uh, ones did you? I'm in the American Legion. Okay. Phantom Post 44. And uh, because uh, I had this, uh, I lost my kneecap in the in the National Guard. Okay. I'm in the uh, DAV, the Disabled American Veterans. Okay. Okay. Now let me kind of wind this up. All right. Um, so that I would like to tell you that my son, our youngest son, went to University of Chicago. And he fooled around and was getting very grades, barely, barely uh, passing. And I said to him, Adam, why don't you take a year off, get your head together. You really don't know what you, you want to do. So he, he says, okay. And he went and joined the Army without well, telling me. And he signed a contract that the Army was going to give him $25,000 when he got out. And they were going to spend a year teaching him Chinese. So he went to Monterey, to the... Uh, in the, the, the Army English Language School and studied Chinese for a year. Mm -hmm. He eventually became a China expert for the military, for the National Security Agency. And he learned Mandarin uh, along with Cantonese. He was so good that if a Chinese general burped, my son heard it. One day he called me up and he said, Dad, they, uh, they asked me if I could come up with an idea of a project to uh, enhance my, uh, you know, my, my uh, job. So I said, yeah, why don't you tell them to send you on a tour of the Pacific Rim? He says, a tour of the Pacific Rim? How much of the Pacific Rim? I said, the whole thing. He said, well, that cost a fortune. They'll never come up with that. I said, look at him. I've dealt with the federal government. I once was asked to come up with some ideas to get a hundred thousand dollars when I was director of tourism for the state of Connecticut and I did it in one afternoon and uh, the commissioner said the army will never, the government will never accept this you got to take this and turn it into 50 pages well as a journalist my whole life has been spent taking big pieces of crap and turning them into page and a half so my son went Gave the proposal, and I said they they want they want big big projects, big mm -hmm. money. He called back and he says, "I'm going on the Pacific Rim thing." <laughs> and he says as he was leaving, his, his commissioner said, "Did you stop at the uh, the business office?" He says, "What for?" He said, "Stop at the business office." So they gave him his uh, 
uh, an, you know, an expense account check for $25,000. <laughs> but it was a marvelous experience for him. Oh, I'm sure. He ended up on the DMZ. And then he started lecturing. He would, he would lecture, and generals would come to his lectures. Hmm. Unfortunately, we lost him to, you know, 36 years old, we lost him to melanoma. Oh. Um, question. Did your Army experience help you with your career later, do you think? Well, yes, because I was with the Army newspaper and I had been traveling all around. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it, it was kind of incentive when uh, I was, uh, after I got out of, out of uh, well, I went back to, um, to Michigan uh, after I came home from the Army. I went back in 1947 on the GI Bill. Okay. And that's when I met my wife. And, uh, and then, I, then I got a job as a reporter on the Hartford Times. And there was a, a, a young reporter from, uh, from Pakistan who had uh, been sent there as an intern by the State Department. And just before he was ready to leave, we were all having lunch together. He said he was going to drive from uh, London to Pakistan. And I said, how would you like to have some company? He said, sure. I didn't know where the hell Pakistan was. You know, they just created the two countries. So I came home and I told Dolores, three days or three weeks later we had put our car in storage, given our dog to my mother, and uh, we, we sold our car, put gave the dog to my mother and furniture in storage, and we were on the boat. We made a fantastic eight-month trip around the world. And I probably would not have been so eager to do it if I hadn't had the experience uh, with, with being in Europe with Stars and Stripes. Hmm. Also, when, when, um, when we got married, we signed up and took a student tour of, of uh, Europe, $500 for the whole summer. And uh, they called me up the day before we were to sail and said, well, you're older than the others on the, and you've been to Europe before. so." Would you be the leader? So I was the leader, and I thought all I had to do was greet the hosts and say, here they are. And I ended up uh, taking the bags in, taking care of the, the kids. I had one girl who was a whiner. We arrived in Rotterdam at four in the morning, and we were about to go to bed, and she calls, or she knocks on the door, and she says, Uncle Barney, the light in my room doesn't work. I says, Betsy, it's four o'clock in the morning. You don't need a light, go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a good experience. It was. There was no no question about it. Yeah, okay. it set it sort of set the stage for you know it was it was a step on the ladder. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is there anything else you would like to add at this point? We're kind of at the end of the format. Yeah. No, I guess that that, that about uh, does it. I I just. Uh, I, I just wish, uh, I, if I may say so, I'd like to wish my uh, grandson Derek uh, all the best and hope that he makes the right decisions. And if he has to go to Afghanistan or or Iraq and Pakistan, that he comes back and hmm. the way he went. One piece. Very good. Well, and I thank uh, you very much. I think we're kind of through the rest of it, unless you have anything else you want to add. No, I, I just want to say that we, we live in a marvelous country and even though we have some wackos and nutcases running around, I've done some studying on American history and we've, been, we've had nutcases and crazies and people that have, for years we always managed to absorb them and, and, and the, the country's moved on. Okay, great. Thank you.